Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to Chapter House Dune Club Session One. It is the beginning of the end, the final Dune Club. We've made it. Welcome back. I am so excited to be here reading the final book in Frank Herbert's Dune Cycle with all of you wonderful Fremen warriors around the world. Chapter House Dune Club is a real achievement, and I was not sure that we would make it all the way here when I started the original Dune Club. I was hoping that we'd get this far, but I had no real way of knowing. I'm I'm no Kwisatz Haderach. I can't see into the future. And I'm just so pleased that we have made it all the way here. And that is really because of you. You out there who have wanted to continue the journey to across the sands of Arrakis through time and space with me. And I feel very honored to have helped you uh, across the cosmos. And I'm just so happy that you guys wanted to keep going and that we made it all the way here. So thank you to all of you Fremen warriors out there online. What a journey it's been, exactly System and Eve. Uh, So yeah, thank you Ripseed for subscribing, by the way, thank you. Uh, Yeah, it's been, we've been doing this for about five years now and uh, wow, it's just great, you know, and I, I, I will say that on my YouTube channel, my Dune Club episodes get the least amount of views of any of my episodes, but they're the ones that I'm the most proud of because it's like, oh, you see, you know, a few thousand views, 5,000 views, and it's like that doesn't seem like that much, but in context of a book club, and you think to yourself, well, how many of those people are actually reading along and reading the book? And I'm, I'm sure not everybody is. Some people are just watching it. But I'm sure a fair amount of people are are reading along. And so, I mean, that is like thousands of people are reading this book around the world. And for a book club, that's some big dick energy. And I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. So thank you again. Uh, so for session one, uh, let's start with a little bit of a recap. So Chapter House Dune picks up directly after the events of Heretics of Dune. It's been around 3,500 years after the death of the god emperor, Leto Atreides II. In the years after his dissolution, humanity took to the stars in a mass exodus to uninhabited planets surrounding the empire in an event called the Scattering. Now, unknown forces from the Scattering are returning, namely the honored Matres, who have been chased from their home... And this all-female organization have been secretly working to take over the old empire using their method of sexually enslaving men until they butt up against the Bene Gesserit, the only force that stands in the way of their plans of total conquest. After Miles Tegg, the Bene Gesserit's finest Bashar, not only escapes from them twice, but single-handedly slaughters a great number of honored Matres and... The Duncan Idaho Gola manages to sexually enslave one of the honored Matres. These women go berserk and follow them to Rackus and destroy the whole planet, including Teg and all the sandworms, but not before Odrade, Teg's reverend mother daughter, Duncan Idaho, Lucilla, Bursmali, and a captured Mirbella, Shiana, and one whole sandworm escape. The group absconds to Chapter House, the sisterhood's secret planet of central command, to regroup for the quote-unquote long night of the horse. (laughs) For this session, you should have read pages 1 through 95 in this particular mass market paperback. There is a link in the description below for those of you on YouTube, if you need to get this copy. And if you are not reading from this copy, you're reading from a different one, the last couple sentences from the last chapter of this session are, what have we done? Israel help her. <laughs> All right, exciting. So let's dive right in to chapter one. A quiet 
celebration. Uh, we have our, our book set up and it's starting off with a bang. Darwi Odrade, our Atreides scion, is now officially the mother superior of the Bene Gesserit. That's right. The Bene Gesserit are being led by an Atreides <laughs> during these dark times. And not only that, but the Sisterhood has created its first axolotl tank. And it's just delivered a baby Miles Tag Gola. That's right. Darwi has got to witness her own dad being born. So weird. What a mind fuck. And now her and Belanda and Tamalane, Belanda and Tamalane are her two like, you know, right hand and left hand women are celebrating <laughs> with a breakfast in Darwi's private dining room. But the two other women have trouble relaxing for the party due to high tension of the times that they are living in. The Bene Gesserit are being hunted to extinction by the honored Matres, and the whores have already exterminated 16 of their planets. Billions of sisters are dead, and hence the need to duplicate Miles Tag, the finest Mentat Bashar ever to serve the sisterhood. And hopefully, the sisterhood can hold out until he is ready to take command. There is also the strange reports surrounding the period just before the Bashar's death on Rackus. Could he really move faster than the eye could see? Could he see no ships? How did he know where to meet them on Rackus? What's that about? We got to find out. So we're going to make a new one and see. The two... Women leave, and Odrade is left with her fears. This situation is worse than what they suffered under the tyrant. It is possibly the worst thing they've ever had to deal with in their long history. And she is forced to make terrible decisions every day. Decisions like writing off their keep on Palma, dooming 1,100 Reverend Mothers and the countless others, acolytes, other people who work for them, all those folks, because attack is imminent and they have no way to defend or evacuate their people. Darwi reflects on the Honored Matre's hysterical xenophobia, which is a hatred of outsiders, and the single-mindedness in their assault on outsiders who arouse their hatred, a weakness that hopefully can be exploited. She reflects on the Bene Gesserit's weakness, their arrogance in believing that they had created an untouchable society and enduring structures, and now look at them, hiding in their enclaves while they are being systematically hunted. But Odrade plans to give these honored matres a real mouthful and let these greedy savages bite off more than they can chew and choke on it. That's right. <laughs> She's going to let them know. Chapter two, the spider queen. We finally meet the great honored Matre, an unremarkable, withered old hag in a red leotard with a red gold robe worked with black dragons. The honored Matres have captured the guild's planetary headquarters named Junction, and she has made this planet her home and enjoys holding court in a great room originally designed for large gatherings of guild navigators in their huge tanks. This room is a big square room. It's got a lot of yellow tiles. It's about 91 stories high and the same width across. 91 stories high. This is one room. This is a big room. <laughs> Currently, she is questioning a captive reverend mother bound in shiga wire on the yellow tile floor beneath her. The woman named <coughs> Sabanda, who worked as a teacher, has told her that the Bene Gesserit call her the Spider Queen, uh, which she's kind of into. She's like, yes, <laughs> I kind of am. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
And this captive Reverend Mother refuses to watch them enslave a weak male. The great Honor Matre asks the woman if she taught her students to worship Shiana, whom she believes was killed in the assault on Arrakis. <coughs> Sabanda denies this, but almost lets it slip that Shiana lives, but she recovers really nicely, leaving Shiana's status ambiguous. This crone is annoyed. Uh, annoyed at this persistent cult of Shiana, annoyed at Sabanda's self-control in the face of her trolling, and annoyed that these witches can choose to die at any moment and are loaded with sheer. So how do you torture and interrogate someone who can check out at any moment? It's, it's not easy. It's not even happening. At her command, an aide approaches and injects the Reverend Mother with a new concoction, hoping that this will free the captive's tongue, but nope. Sabanda kills herself seconds after the injector touches her neck. Oh well, feed her body to our captive futars. It's only a matter of time before we find the witch's hiding place. The game is on. Again, there's a lot of mirroring going on in these chapters. So we start off with Odraid at the top of the Bene Gesserit hierarchy and how she's feeling about this whole situation. And then now we see the great honor Matre and how she's feeling about all of this, you know. So we have these, these nice chapters right next to each other. Chapter three, there are things I can't remember. Miles... Tag is back, and Odraid lets him know that he's a Gola at the tender age of two. Uh, apparently, they used skin cells from his neck harvested from underneath Odraid's fingernails. At some point, she kind of got a little, little, little epithelial cells, <laughs> as they call them on forensic files. She tells him, you are a special child. We made you from the cells taken from a very old man. So technically, he's not really a Gola. He's more of a clone because Golas are created from dead cells, whereas he's been created from living cells. Odraid frequently takes little Miles into the orchards to play, and he knows that she enjoys their excursions just as much as he does. She is the only one who shows him affection and does not talk down to him. She also lets him call her mother when they are alone together in this place, but nowhere else. Don't let anyone hear you. By age seven, he is showing signs of mental brilliance and holographic memory. I love the description of holographic memory because we've all heard of um, what, photographic memory, which is a two dimensional you can remember things, but you remember them in two dimensional. But, you know, Miles is holographic memory. So he's got three dimensional memory. So he's on another level, like, than the geniuses we have in our day and age. <laughs> he becomes aware uh, that, oh, yeah, at seven, he becomes aware that he's carrying memories and uh, he cannot recall them. Odraid assures him, oh, PJ says, holographic memory is a misnomer. It's identic memory. Uh, you know, I was just thinking that, too. I was like, because that's not really, like, as I was saying it, I was like, photographic memory. It's just like, you don't just look, like, remember a picture. You know, like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Anyways, whatever. The, it's neither here nor there. We're moving on. Odraid assures him that one day he will remember these memories. And sometimes he finds that he knows the names of things before they are taught to him, especially the names of weapons, but also herbs and like other things. And that year, he began studying his previous life, which I mean, that's so wild. Like, can you imagine? You're like, oh, this was me. <laughs> like, it's so weird. He is both fascinated and troubled by these studies, as anyone would be. And one day in the orchards, the two discuss the intensity of the bees and the heaviness of the fruit that year, which is due to the desert growing in the south, how life breeds more intensely when threatened. One day, this entire planet will become a desert if things go well, if things go the way they want them to. Um, 
side note, I really did like that the bees leave them alone because they are pheromone marked, as is everyone who belongs on this planet. But it, like if they weren't marked with the pheromones, like the bees would attack them. And it's like, I love these defensive measures on this planet. I mean, they talk about cows in the last book where if cows smell someone who don't have the pheromones, they'll start stampeding and going crazy. And not only have they put these defensive measures in their cows, they've also put them in their bees. <laughs> so it's like, yes, fascinating. During one of their orchard outings in the ninth year, in his ninth year, the mother superior takes the opportunity to school the boy on the impermanence of life, asking him philosophical questions about ownership. Do we own the planet or does it own us? What do you think, little Miles? She explains that each planet that humans colonize, they attempt to draw the patterns of old earth and recapture their origins, sometimes faintly, sometimes more clearly, like they have done on Chapter House. They discuss the idea of stewardship of a planet and how the land and stewards deeply mark one another. Audrey leads her conversation to the idea of symbiotic relationships between plants. Miles gets bored during her lecture and he kicks a clump of grass, which leads to another lecture on the importance of this grass. She goes back to the topic of the growing desert, how their orchards and grapes will die to make room for more important life, the sandworms and the melange. All of this leads back to where they started, the topic of the illusion of ownership. She says to him, humans have this deep desire to classify, to apply labels to everything, because that way we lay claim to what we name. We assume an ownership that can be misleading and dangerous. My street, my lake, my planet, my label forever, a label you give to a place or a thing may not even last out your lifetime except as a polite sop granted by conquerors or a sound to remember in fear. Miles connects the dots of why she is telling him all of this, and it's to remind him of their potential impermanence in the face of the honored Montre's crusade to extinguish the Bene Gesserit. Miles assures Audrey that he will protect them once he is their Bashar again, which was so cute. He's like, not on my watch, mom. It's adorable. Audrey checks his childish aggression and reminds the boy that the Bashar was just as famous for creating situations where no battle was necessary. They head back to Central and Miles looks back on the orchards they emerged from and remembers an afternoon when Odraid had taken him over at Central in a thopter ride to give him an overview of the city and how it works uh, as closely to a closed ecological circle as they can make it. And he has an epiphany. His latent mentat abilities activate and he sees the pattern of the Bene Gesserit that the sisterhood are farmers of humanity. Odraid is pleased at his perceptiveness and tells the boy that she will direct his teachers to place more emphasis on the subtle use of power to hone his mental weapons. All right, yes, little baby Miles, he's so cute. I love him. Miles Tag is the best character. He's so good. Happy to have him back. Chapter four, grunts and moans in the darkness. What an unsettling chapter. Back on Junction, Logno, the senior aide to the great honored Matre, whose name is Dama, has been summoned to her master's sleeping chamber. She enters into the pitch black room, high key anxious, and hears grunts and moans in the darkness. Is she fucking a futar? Maybe. She dares many things. <laughs> Futars cannot be bonded through sex though. So fun fact, you can fuck a futar, but they can't be bonded. It smells weird in here. And Logno closes the door, she waits, she hears another moan, and then her master's voice instructing her to sit, sit there on the floor by the door. Logno's like, fuck, can she really see me? Like, it's so dark in here, like, Jesus. And she thinks about poisoning this bitch someday. 
and like how people have totally ascended to power before through poisoning. I mean, it's kind of a, a lame way to do it, but it's been done before. Dama asks her aide how her meeting went with the Ixians about the weapon. So the weapon is a mysterious object. It requires the charge to work and can be used only once. The council holds the charge and the great honored Matre holds the weapon. But who the fuck is the council? This is my question because I was really trying to figure this out and I was having a hard time. I assume there is an honored Matre council it, to kind of balance out the, the great honored Matre situation. But a council, by its very nature, sounds very anti-honored Matre. I mean, they're very hierarchical. So I'm not entirely sure who the fuck the council is who's holding the charge. I'm not going to lie to you. I tried to find out. I was like Googling. I was not having it. It did not work out for me. Maybe I'll figure it out as I continue to reread this book. The weapon is described as a small black tube that can be held in the hand and with a charge, it can cut a brief swath of bloodless death across the arc of its limited range. Daiso says, it sounds very Spartan. They had kings and a senate. Yeah, I mean, that's what I assume it is. It's just like, I just don't think it's ever brought up again or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. It's just, it's, there's a lot of vagary in these books. And this is one of those things where I'm like, wait, wait, what? I need more information, Frank, but I don't think he's going to give it to me. They were only able to salvage about 300 units of the weapon after fleeing the ones of the many faces and their futars from the disaster that caused them to fall back into the old empire. And they need to restock if they ever hope to return to that battle. So, I mean, yeah, right now they're taking over the old empire. Hopefully they can get these Ixians to duplicate their weapon and then they can, you know, go back and fight these fuckers who kicked them out. Uh, Logno asks, well, what about the charge, though? Uh, and Tom was like, look, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But I think it's also funny, too, because they're like meeting with the Ixians about it. Like, can you make this? But then they won't tell them what it is. <laughs> it's just like you can't like. You can't go to a bunch of engineers and say, I need you to make this, but I'm not going to tell you what it does or what it's for. Like, that's so crazy. But honor Matres, man, they'd be wild. And Dama and Logno also discuss the Bene Gesserit planet Bazel, which is rich in Sioux stones and seems undefended. But it feels sus, feels like it might be a trap. And uh, Dama thinks it's probably a trap. She's like, yes, the Bene Gesserits are weak, but I don't think they're stupid. Logno is commanded to leave and hears a hissing yes before she makes her exit and hurries towards the light. Oof. Gross. Gross. Man, this does not sound like a fun organization to work for. <laughs> All right. Moving on. <clears throat> Chapter five. I am Sea Child. We are back on Chapter House with Odraid in her workroom as she's getting water images from her subconscious. She senses Sea Child floating in the waves. Uh, and these waves are the color of blood. And so she knows to expect that bloody times are ahead of her. Sea Child is Odraid's deepest sense of self, a persona that comes from the memories of her childhood on the Gamu coast with her surrogate parents during the hidden years before the Bene Gesserit took her into the sisterhood. Uh, sea Child is her personal concept of sanity came from those times, the ability to balance on strange seas, the ability to maintain your deepest self despite unexpected waves. I float, therefore... I am Sea Child. She thinks fondly of Papa and Mama Sibia, who had impressed strength upon her and taught her to love herself. Odraid's secret core is self-love, happiness with herself and enjoying her own company, a thing the sisterhood could never root out and erase. Because you know how they're like anti-love, even if it's self-love. <laughs> it's interesting if you remember Taraz's core 
was rage. She was just fucking raging in there. And it's like, Audrey's like the total opposite. She's just like, I just really like myself. I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know what's wrong with you guys. Odraid wonders if Sea Child is sending her a prescient warning born out of her Atreides heritage. Is it about Lampadas, their most prized planet of schooling? Had it been destroyed? Her talent cannot say. In addition to these glimpses, she also gets dreams, and she has this reoccurring dream where she's walking a tightrope across a vast chasm, and there is a axeman coming up from behind her to sever the rope. And she's desperately trying to get across before the axe can come down and sever the rope. And she knows that if she falls into this chasm, the sisterhood falls with her. The Reverend Mother Superior fears the honored Matres discovering Chapter House. How many would escape if they did? Who would be captured? If they got Shiana, would they know how to exploit her as a potent religious force? If they got Gola Duncan or Gola Tag, what then? Many of her sisters fear that these two men are way too dangerous and that they should be killed. Many of her sisters feel that she is too dangerous and watch her just as closely as she watches Duncan and Miles. The honored Matres would flip out if they discovered either of these two Golas could see no ships. And she suspects that Tag might be able to do that. She puts her worries aside and casts her mind to the childhood days of floating in the sea and is restored by this memory. Odraid calls up a projection of the no ship where Duncan, Marbella, and the last Leilaxu master are held, thinking of the enormous amount of energy spent on keeping this machine in standby mode when Belanda walks in. She walked as though she hated the floor, stamping on it as if to say, there, take that, and that beating the floor because it was guilty of being underfoot. Belanda is such a fucking bitch. Bitchy Belle. She cracks me up. Belle announces Lampadas has in fact been destroyed. No survivors. Lucilla, dead. Bursmali, dead. The reports came in through Chrome, fr through Chome spies from the rabbi. Odraid's warning has come to fruition. Not ready to reveal her true plan, she pays lip service to the idea of vicious retaliation to satiate Belle's anger. Odraid looks to her other advisor, Tamalane, and senses the older woman withdrawing and pulling back from life. She mentally resolves to replace her with Shiana, even though she will miss Tam. I know, Belanda is so pissed all the time. <laughs> like, uh, but even, like, Belanda has a great arc. She really does. I'm excited for you guys to, to read more about her. Her and Shiana are, like, Shiana, like, trolls her so bad, and it's fantastic, but I'm not going to say anything else. Chapter 6, A Secret Society on Gamu. Surprise, Lucilla is not dead. She is still alive. She barely escaped the destruction of Lampadas in a no ship and has made it back to her favorite planet, Gamu. We know how much she loves Gamu. The imprinter is hiding out in a retired souk doctor's isolated farmhouse and she is carrying a heavy burden. The other memories of her fallen sisters who died on Lampadas. Her mission to preserve this treasure trove of other memory and deliver them back to the sisterhood for safekeeping. So all these women may be dead, but Lucilla's got it all up here. She's got it all. She's got to deliver this package. Lucilla learned of this super secret souk contact from Odraid before being assigned to Lampadas. Dar privately tells her about the secret society of Jews on Gamu and countless other planets around the universe. Eons ago, they made the defensive decision called Complete Cover, and vanished from public view in an attempt to avoid the recurrent problem of pogrom, a.k.a. organized massacre of an ethnic group. When they come close to discovery, someone kind of figures out like, hey, what's going on here? They feign that they are merely revivalists. Oh, we're seeking the roots of our old religion. And people are like, oh, God, revivalists. Okay, never mind. And then they get left alone. 
And this strategy works. And it works really well on everybody, except for the Bene Gesserit, who let it slide for a time. They knew about them. But eventually, uh, many, 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 many years ago, they made contact after seeing a potential need for a secret society responsive to their requests for assistance. And it is a two-way street. Sometimes they make uh, their own demands upon the sisterhood as well. So in return for their cooperation, the Bene Gesserit have promised to die before revealing their secret existence. Now, undercover, she watches a large carrier from the window. The driver flicks a gaze at her before returning to his work. She thinks of country life and how you could measure the urban density of an area by when work stopped. Early to bed and you were, and you were in a loosely packed region. Night activity said people remained restless, twitchy with inner awareness of others active and vibrating too near. I really love this observation because it's so true. It's so funny when I go to other places and there's just, it's a low density spot and people really do go to bed way earlier and everything gets just so quiet and everyone just like is in bed very early and are, are not out at the bars or not out. i mean there's a few but like there's not a lot of bars there are not a bunch of people running around but then when you go to a city it's like that's you know the denser the city the the later it stays up new york city for example is like insane like i mean they say it's a city that never sleeps and that's true <laughs> it's like yes there is always somebody up doing something because it is so densely packed it's a little too densely packed for me lucilla is getting nervous at how long the rabbi is taking to return and she's hoping that they can find a way to get her off planet but there is a guild navigator one of the edricks on the planet searching for her and the rabbi is doubtful that they can smuggle her out but promises to whisper in a few ears and see what he can do to help. Looking around at an extensive farm, she wonders if Pogrom was really the only reason for vanishing from public view. Uh, outside survival, the least common denominator in all human affairs is profit. She accepted this as cynical, but from vast experience. Attempts to weed it out of human behavior always broke up on the rocks of application. Socializing and communistic systems only changed the counters that measured profits. Enormous managerial bureaucracies. The counter was power. So I, I liked that little deal. You know, people are like, oh, you know, capitalism is so fucked and we need to change it to a different system. And it's like, it doesn't matter what system we're using because humans are using the system and humans are inherently flawed. And he, it's like, it doesn't matter what tool you use. A tool is just a tool. It can be used in a great way. It can be used in a really bummer, shitty way. And if the people that are using this are fucked up, then it's going to be fucked up no matter what system you're using. Like, no matter what. Like, it's just, uh, and I, I just love this little tidbit in there. I was like, yes, you're so right. Her fawning over her, the rabbi's fawning over her, also tripped her warning sense. And was he out there seeing how much he could sell her for? Um, yes, uh, we are all a little broken. Exactly, Elise. I know thoughts for the election, Eve. I know we are all a little broken. It is. It's true. But that's what she's saying is like the least common denominator in all human affairs outside of survival is profit. People are always trying to profit. And that's and it's human. And that's fine. And profiting isn't bad unless it becomes so much so that it's like oh you're taking from everyone else and then you just have so much and you can't even use all of this and it's like totally absurd and ridiculous you know <laughs> like it's like it's there's nothing wrong with profiting until you know it gets to be i mean it can get to be a little bit too much <sighs> um if you're gonna profit like that then you should like find ways to you know put it back into the system in my opinion uh, let's see here. So the rabbi returns. He's thick with the smell of melange. And he has been detained by Edric. That's why he's late. The guild navigator suspects them. But then again, he suspects everyone. And the reverend mother smells fear on the rabbi. And he goes on this weird tangent. He says, incomplete suppression of trade in any commodity always increases the 
increases the profits of the tradesmen, especially profits of the senior distributors. That is the fallacy of thinking you can control unwanted narcotics by stopping them at your borders. And it's like, oh my God, talking shit about the war on drugs too? Oh, Frank Herbert, it doesn't work. It just makes those people make more money. Like, uh, it's so great, it's fantastic. Lucilla thinks, why is he pointing my attention to border guards? Does he have someone in his pocket that he can pay off to like get me out of here? Like, I don't think that's like, that can't be it. He goes on to say, or she, she goes on to realize that guards always had a ready realization for betraying their superiors. If I don't, someone else will, you know? So it's like they're, they can pay me off or they can pay off my friend over there. So I might as well get paid off for this. He tells her the truth that he does not believe that there is any way he can get her off of Gamu alive. But maybe he can smuggle the information that she carries. And Lucilla is confused. She's like, I don't just, I can't just tell you a couple things and like, that's it. Like I, I have like 7 billion lives like in my brain right now. Like, I, I, like I, no, what? And the rabbi makes her promise not to turn against them if he reveals the secret and will only help her if she accepts his solution sight unseen. Lucilla has no choice. She gives him his word and the deal is struck. The rabbi then introduces her to Rebecca, a surprise, wild Jewish reverend mother, not of the Bene Gesserit. So she's... She has she she went through the agony. She has her other other memories, all that stuff. But she was not trained by the Bene Gesserit. Lucilla shares the Lampadas horde of other memory with Rebecca. And while the two women's consciousnesses are locked, Lucilla sees the rabbi's whole plan. The rabbi plans to sell Lucilla to the honored matres. That was what the produce carrier was doing earlier, was confirming that she was there. And Rebecca explains, this was the only way we could save ourselves and maintain our credibility. And Lucilla is like, fuck, that's really clever. I get it, but like, fuck. <laughs> On to our next chapter, chapter seven, new pressures and secret defiance. So now we've touched base with Lucilla. Let's touch base with Shiana. Our girl is back. And now she is a full grown reverend mother of the Bene Gesserit living in the Desert Watch station on Chapter House. Our Lady of the Worms is at her sculpting stand working with a block of black plaz with her gray claw-shaped shaper gloves, which work when you swoop around the plaz and then the plaz reacts like a wave being driven by an insane wind. Fucking cool. As an artist, yes. <laughs> like, fucking cool. I love it. She's feeling frustrated and unhappy with her sculpture and ends up reducing the whole thing to a black blob. <sighs> with her gloves. She's not happy with it. She did not quite get the result she was looking for. She doesn't even know what the result exactly is, but it's in her and it's not here and that's not it. So pff, I love that. You know, when you like draw something and you hate it and it's not what you wanted it and then you're like, and you scratch it out. It's like the exact same thing. Shiana leaves her studio and goes to the window and looks out on the growing desert, wondering if the sandworms will ever reappear. And if they do, she knows that the sisterhood is ready to use their missionaria protectiva and launch a holy Shiana as a potent religious figure ripe for adoration of the masses. See how she commands the sandworms. <laughs> oh. And our girl is not looking forward to this potential role. She has no desire to be a living saint tool to further Bene Gesserit control over the masses. And in the proud tradition of female child stars who are forced to project an image of purity and later 
over-sexualize themselves, such as, take your pick, Britney Spears, Miley Cyrus, Ariana Grande, <laughs> Shiana has been engaging in outrageous sexual exploits, even by Bene Gesserit standards, as a form of personal rebellion against the religious role that she is being prepared for. She says that she's just polishing the males that Duncan is training in sexual bondage, which, by the way, Duncan is training other guys in how to enslave the ladies so they can fight against the honored matres. But I just keep thinking, like, oh, no, what happens when the war is over to all these dudes who know how to do this? Like, how is... Ah! Anyways, whatever. That's uh, totally a side tangent. Um... So, but anyways, this polishing is just an excuse to get away with it. But how long until Belle and the others, the sisters who see and fear the wildness in her eyes, how long until they do something about her behavior? And how long until her sisters pick up on her secret hand talks with Duncan? Oh, yeah. They're hand talking in secret. They talk about alternative ways to restore Teg's memory. They talk about rebelling against the Bene Gesserit. They are plotting their escape. But where would they go? Who would accept them not as sacred Shiana and her consort, but merely as fugitives? Even though she's glad that Marbella ruined the sisterhood's plan for Duncan to sexually imprint upon her, she still might be harboring some feelings for him, but it's unclear. Shiana thinks on Marbella and how she has successfully domesticated Duncan, where she herself may have failed. Marbella is a fascinating study, and she's got jokes. The disgraced honored Matre wrote a cute little poem mocking the Missionaria Protectiva and posted it on the wall in the Acolyte's dining room. And it goes a little something like this. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Working Class, for subscribing. Hey, God, I hope you're there. I want you to hear my prayer, that graven image on my shelf. Is it really you or just myself? Well, anyway, here it goes. Please keep me on my toes. Help me pass my worst mistakes, doing it for both our sakes. For an example of perfection to the proctors of my section, or merely for the heaven of it, like bread for the leaven of it. For whatever reason may incline, please act for yours and mine. <laughs> and O'Train is so bummed when she finds out that it was Marbella who wrote this and she confronts her about it. And Marbella's like, yeah, afraid so. It was me. Afraid so, bitch. Was, oh, I was cracking up. Shiana is determined not to be a Bene Gesserit religious pawn and feels she must create her own life, even if that means going against her sisters and leaving the Bene Gesserit, becoming a rogue reverend mother. So, you know, Shiana may be older. Uh, she may be a reverend mother, but she's still wild as fuck, okay? Shiana ain't stopping, okay? She's fucking fools like, oh, we use these crazy Bene Gesserit, Otter Matre imprinting methods, smushing them together. She's wild. She's never going to stop. And she's an artist, which I love. <laughs> I love her artistic side. Chapter eight, Watchdogs. Let's talk about, I mean, pretty much every chapter in this section had a really great header, but I didn't want to get caught up on talking about every single one of these headers, so I just tried to pick out a couple of my favorite ones. This header for this chapter is absolutely one of my favorite quotes and ideas in the whole series. It's so well done. Confine yourself to observing and you always miss the point of your own life. The object can be stated this way. Live the best life you can. Life is a game whose rules you learn if you leap into it and play it to the hilt. Otherwise, you are caught off balance, continually surprised by the shifting play. Non-players often whine and complain that luck always passes them by. They refuse to see that they can create some of their own luck. Yes. 
such wisdom, Frank Herbert. Such wisdom. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it. I've just, I get so much from this quote and I just really want to share it with the world. And hopefully some people out there can get it, get something from it. Um, yeah, it's non-players often, like non-players. When I think non-players, I think NPCs. <laughs> like, and, like now it is like NPCs often whine and complain that luck always passes them by. And it's just like, you got to become a player, dog. You got to become a player. Um, we are back with Odraid, who is feeling the pressures of command. She is busy with a new Bene Gesserit scattering. They are sending cells of sisters out into the unknown on no ships stocked with sand trout. So not only are they sending out these little clumps of women into, and they don't even know where they're, they're like, we can't know because if anyone ever attacks us, we don't want to have any information saying where we've sent you. So you just got to go and we don't know where the fuck you're going. But not only are they sending them out, they're also sending them out with sand trout to hopefully plant the sandworms on as many fucking planets as possible. Will they survive? Will the Bene Gesserit continue out there? I mean, none of the Bene Gesserit from the original scattering ever came back. Will the sisterhood ever be whole again? Odrade is so sad that she's having to tear apart the fabric of her sisterhood. And Belanda is pestering her to discuss the most recent Idaho records. That's their favorite reality TV show on Chapter House, is the Idaho and Marbella show. And Tam, meanwhile, is worried about Idaho and Marbella's three children. They've had three kids. He's knocked her up three times. <laughs> And all of them have been removed at birth and observed with care. Marbella's not stoked about it, but she deals with it. Duncan kind of doesn't give a fuck. And Odraid's kind of like, that's weird, but maybe he's like a Reverend Mother. Maybe he's into the Bene Gesserit thing. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. The question is, do these children have dangerous fucking talents? Also, will they display the uncanny honored Matre speed that Marbella has? It's too early to tell. The record in question is a conversation between Marbella and Duncan after a hot and heavy session in bed. They're still addicted to each other, so they're just constantly having these epic fuck sessions. And all of this is on camera, okay? Like, these, these are all recorded. She boasts after sex that she could kill him. No problem. Don't you forget, homie. I could fucking kill you at any moment. Not that she's going to because she's obsessed with his dick, but whatever. To prove her point... She leaps out of bed in a blur and kicks a fatal blow at him, stopping her foot a hair's breadth from his head. <sighs> and Mirbella moved with no resort to her central cortex, insect-like, an attack triggered by nerves at the point of muscle ignition. Odraid and the rest are really hoping Mirbella's three daughters have this speed and that one day they will have reverend mothers with this fast-as-fuck ability. Duncan is completely unmoved by this demonstration and smiles at his silly, angry little lover. Belle thinks Marbella did all of this for them, the watchers, knowing that they're watching, but uh, and not for Duncan, but Odraid is not so sure. The two women discuss Marbella's consistent anger when questioned about honored matre motives techniques and history bell believes the woman is under hypnotrance injunction against answering those types of questions a secret technique used by the bene gesserit another disturbing clue pointing to bene gesserit heritage within the honored matre history many acolytes are disturbed by the honored matre's sexual techniques a power that is both attractive and repulsive to them Many complain of dreams about becoming honored matres. Belanda's hypothesis for this whole sitch is that maybe honored matre with a captive reverend mother taken prisoner from that first scattering. They said, hey, welcome, reverend mother. We would like you to witness a small demonstration of our powers. 
interlude of sexual demonstration followed by a display of honored matre physical speed then withdrawal of melange and injection of the adrenaline based substitute laced with hypno drug and in that hypothetical trance the reverend mother was sexually imprinted that coupled to the selective agony of melange withdrawal might make the victim deny her origins we just don't know while the calm eye record is playing, Odraid catches Marbella stating, the honored Matres did this to themselves and they can't blame anyone else. Duncan denies he did anything to himself and he blames the Leiloxu conditioning. And Marbella hotly argues that that is total bullshit. That you didn't just perform based on your instincts. You took it to the limits, pal. You improvised and improved upon your instincts. Don't even act like you're just going to blame this on the Laylock Sue. Idaho admits this and says perhaps it was both. It was the same for both of them, you know, because she was also doing a lot of improvising herself. His lover uh, agrees, saying both of them can't blame anyone but themselves for this sexual pickle that they are in. <laughs> Tam walks into the workroom and announces she believes Sightail, the Leiloxu master, the last living Leiloxu master, has withheld vital information regarding the axolotl tanks, keeping some bargaining chips for himself. Odraid thinks on the horror of these tanks, which aren't really tanks at all, but women, with their wombs being used as birthing machines, and how disgusted they were to find this out at first. And then how they rationalized, oh, we really need a gola, like... Maybe we should make a tank, a tank. And then eventually they found volunteers of women who said they would willingly turn into a tank where you're just a mound of flesh hooked up to a bunch of wires and you're not conscious anymore and you're just this gross birthing machine. Like who would volunteer for that? But I don't know. I guess somebody would. Tam and Belle argue about killing Idaho until Odraid has had enough and orders lunch for them all. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed, PJ, specifically, uh, the the food descriptions are already boop going up. They There was a saying in the Bene Gesserit that the sisterhood ran smoother when the mother superior's stomach was satisfied. So Tam and Belle are like, fine, orders lunch. And they are served a veal casserole. And I, I did love the the little moment where Odraid sees Tam and Belle just eating. They're not even enjoying it. And like she's like savoring this. There's rosemary in it. The the vegetables are not overcooked. Everything's so good. And she's like, maybe this is why I am the mother superior and they are not. Because they don't even know how to enjoy food. And that's something I've been working on is eating eating more slowly. I kind of eat fast sometimes and i need to slow down so i'm, I'm working on that as a, as a human it's, it's slowing down when i eat savor it yes um so while they're eating they're talking about the gossip among the acolytes in the common rooms and there are many acolytes who are interested in the archives to find out if they have a heavy siona gene mark because many of them want to go out into the scattering like rats from a sinking ship Broken record Belanda continues to pound on the idea of killing Idaho. Sightail too, maybe, until Odraid snaps at her. Watchdogs can bark too long. Shut the fuck up, Belle. I get it. I hear it. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Odraid once tried to explain the Bene Gesserit concept of watchdogs to Marbella once. Uh, the constant monitoring of sisters by sisters to see that none of them fall into shallow ways. Mirbella thinks the whole thing sounds oppressive and that their little calm eyes are repellent. She is also saddened by the concept of potentially having to give up her love, Duncan, to become a sister and disapproves of the Bene Gesserit injunctions against love and affection. Odraid is secretly elated and hopes Mirbella does not give up her affections. Belanda thinks that they are wasting their time with this honored matre, and Odraid is glad that at least she's no longer calling her whore. That's an improvement. <laughs> we've, we've made, there's some, something here going on, so I'll take it.
Urban and Jai love these intimate moments between sisters. I know it's so much fun, like getting on the inside of the sisterhood because we get far deeper inside the sisterhood in this book than we have in any other book. I mean, we got a little bit in the last book, but in this one, like we're like on central, like in the command room, like seeing all this stuff go on and it's really fun. Chapter nine, there are no innocents. Here's another banger header. And he's said this one before in different ways. Like, this isn't the first time that he's said this. Like, there's several kind of quotes that are variations on this quote. All governments suffer a recurring problem. Power attracts pathological personalities. It is not that power corrupts, but that it is magnetic to the corruptible. Such people have a tendency to become drunk on violence, a condition to which they are quickly addicted. Yes a good one it's a real fire quote thanks frank herbert so we're back on junction in that giant fucking room <laughs> it's really big it's like the biggest room ever and now it's not the biggest room ever but it's really big. it's really i mean it's the biggest it's bigger than any room i think that's in existence on this planet um whatever rebecca is in the hot seat she is kneeling in the center of this room it's been two fucking hours kneeling not daring to look up at the great honored Matre as she and her attendants eat lunch. So again, while Odrade is hanging out with her attendants, she's like, let's get lunch, you know, and like orders lunch and like everybody's just like chilling. And then meanwhile, you have Dama and she is having lunch while she has someone like kneeling for two hours waiting for them to finish. And, uh, while she's waiting, Rebecca's eyes are hurting from the transplants that she got less than a month ago to hide her blue within blue eyes because since she's a reverend mother, she's got the eyes of Ibad. And uh, this trick of, of putting in new eyes, it only works for like less than a year because she's still on the spice so that these new eyes will eventually turn blue within blue as well. In addition to the eye transplants, she also has an organic implant that feeds her with metered doses of melange. So if she's ever captured, she's got about 60 days before withdrawals will start kicking in. Uh, and she's also being dosed with shear from that implant as well. And while she waits, the speaker of her mohalata, the horde of her other memories, which sounds a lot like Lucilla, counsels her, telling her that she's doing well and just continue to be patient. Just kneel, be patient. You're doing great, sis. Rebecca recalls a conversation she had with a rabbi late at night in his study after she had absorbed the memories of Lampadas. He fears what he has done to her and is worried that she has been tainted by taking on these memories, that she has been taken from them by this action. They debate the merits of this happening, and Rebecca, too, wonders if she has become Bene Gesserit, more Bene Gesserit than Jew, perhaps. She argues for the sisterhood, saying that they only seek to influence the maturing of humanity. The rabbi is not convinced that the Bene Gesserit are truly wise. He says, let me tell you a thing about the Bene Gesserit. Perhaps they have been too long the road to Damascus without a blinding flash of illumination, Rebecca. I hear them say they act for the benefit of human humankind. Somehow I cannot see this in them, nor do I believe the tyrant saw it. Mature humanity, that is their grail. Is it not the mature fruit that is plucked and eaten? And by the way, uh, the they've been too long on the road to Damascus without a blinding flash is a story from the Bible. There was this guy, Saul, and he hated Jesus and he hated his followers. And he was on the road to Damascus with like some law or piece of paper saying they were going to like kill you know anyone or what you know like it was just like oh we got to get rid of this motherfucker and while he's on the road there's a blinding flash and he's literally blinded um but then he's also like converted and like god speaks to him and is like why are you what's your problem and he's like oh fuck you know oh no like you actually are cool as fuck oh you're god oh, i was wrong and then he converts to paul so that's what that whole thing is about Anyways, she remembers 
these words about the mature fruit uh, that is plucked and eaten while watching the great Andromache finish eating her lunch, wiping her hands on an attendant's gown. Oh my God. Dama is so funny. Like she's just like, oh, I'm done. Okay, come here. Put some on somebody's gown. It's like so evil. I love it. She finally summons Rebecca and Logno comes from behind and stabs a shunt goat into Rebecca's left shoulder. And the woman staggers to the foot of the steps and is jabbed to stop a kneel. The great honor Matre commands her to look upon her and begins questioning her. Have you ever known a Bene Gesserit? What do you know of them? Are they brave? Are they rich? Where are they? Rebecca gives perfect answers in that she does not ever lie nor does she give any useful information. Uh, her mohalata is proud of her. You are truly worthy of us, girl. You are doing great with these questions. Then she is questioned about truth say and offers to relate the words of her late husband, who was a truth sayer. The audience around them is getting bored. The orange flecks are starting to show up. And Rebecca is like, God damn, these people want me dead. So she makes a gamble and asks the great honored Matre for menial employment in her service. Please, just give me a job. You're so awesome. I love you guys. I want to be here all the time. She pulls it like this is like the perfect um, reverse psychology moment. And it just like works like such a charm. Uh, Dama says, you will go back to your miserable existence on Gamu, wretch, and will not kill you. That would be a mercy. Having seen what we could give you, live your life without it. <laughs> and then she sends her home with a warning saying, we are watching you. Uh, which uh, that whole exchange was really funny. On the way back to Gamu, Rebecca thinks about her late husband and what he shared with her about his truth sense ability. <laughs> Trust your gut feelings. That's what my teachers always said. There is no secret. It's training and hard work like anything else. You exercise what they call petite perception, the ability to detect very small variations in human reactions. You accumulate a lot of small observations, sensed but never brought to consciousness. Cumulatively, they say things to you, but not in a language anyone speaks. Language isn't necessary. I depend upon my own internal reactions. I read myself, not the person in front of me. I always know a lie because I want to turn my back on the liar. I was like, oh, this is so fascinating. I love all this information on how truth sense works. And then he talks about another girl who she she would know a liar when she would feel the need to like hook her arm in theirs and take and take them on a walk and comfort the liar. So, I mean, it's like that, that sense is different for every everybody but his was like he would he would feel like he'd want to turn their back on him anyways he goes on to say that to be a great uh truth there you have to know nothing learn to be totally naive you approach everything with a clean slate nothing on you or in you Whatever comes is written there by itself. You are the original ignorant savage, completely unsophisticated to the point where you back right into ultimate sophistication. You find it without looking for it. And that's something that Frank Herbert states a lot through all of these books is the importance of cultivating naivety and just being able to like let things come of their own accord and not judge them and not have like your preconceived judgments or your, what, what is the, there's like a Chinese term for it where acquired conditioning, do not let your acquired, like unlearn your acquired conditioning, let go of your judgments and just let it happen. And uh, I think that's a really interesting thing that just like of, of all the things that he says, that's something that comes up a lot. Her husband goes on to explain that when the twitch came, he knew it. I knew it, that it had been there all along. It was familiar. It was my truth sense twitching. It belonged to me and I belonged to it. No separation ever again. Some of it I hate. Seeing some people this way is like seeing them eviscerated, their guts hanging out. But there are compensations. There are people you meet who are like beautiful flowers extended to you by an innocent child. 
She makes it home. And yet Rabbi is not pleased. Now that she's been with her other memory for longer and is more fully integrated with it, she's feeling far more confident in her late night discussions with him in his study. He calls her unclean. And she reminds him, we are all unclean. Okay, we come from unclean ancestors. All of us are descendants from people who did terrible things. It is the victors who breed. I don't want to hear it. Barbarism is not even the proper word for some of the evil things our ancestors did. Some things our ancestors have done to base the worst label you could even imagine, Rabbi. Shut up. The rabbi tries to make excuses, but homegirl is having none of it. Don't make excuses about necessities of the time. When are we without moral sense? Never. It's just that sometimes we don't listen, rabbi. You I have always loved and respected. I went through the agony for you. I shared lampadas for you. Do not deny what I have learned from this. The thing I must deal with most immediately and without respite is that there are no innocents. <laughs> it's not a balance book that you can set aright. How far back would you go? The further back you go, rabbi, the worse the evil atrocities and the higher the price. The rabbi cannot take all of this truth and pleads with her to stop this evil talk. She leaves him and as she closes his door, she hears him say, what have we done? Israel, help her. <laughs> and that is the end of Chapter House Doom Club session one. For session two, you need to read pages 96 through 204. And the last sentence of the last chapter of this session is, we will dine together, sister. For the moment, you are more important than anything else. I know that's two sentences, but it just didn't make sense in context to just do the last one. So I did two. Um, so yes, there we go. Thank you guys so much for uh, coming back and hanging out. And let me see here. Hold on. And don't forget, you can still get a final Dune pack if you're loving this club and you want to represent. You can get one on danigaxix.bigcartel.com. And you get this really cool sticker sheet that I designed, a Marbella bookmark, a um, three pins. Well, maybe two. It depends. There's one pack with two pins and one pack with three pins. But yes, there's the, uh, there's the Desert Watch Center. You know, that's for this one, this hold on, this one, this one down here. Yes, this one. <laughs> that's this, this is the fucking pin for this deal. I based it off of a NASA. I was looking at NASA pens uh, when I designed this one. And then you can also get a magnet with that. So get them while they're hot. And uh, thank you all so much for coming back out. And oh, goodness, hold on. I always do this. It's the same hotkeys. You think I'd change the hotkeys, but I just don't. And we're just gonna do this every time. Uh, so now that we're done with this session, uh, for those of you on the live session on Twitch, we are gonna do some questions and answers from our people on Patreon. And then uh, some, some of the people in the chat. I also, want to thank these lovely people for all their generosity and support on patreon.com slash danica xix cyberwolf 35 davy sockrocker jennifer g keith j pjb uncle marcus and warren wagner see you next week for session two